So hey, well, welcome everybody. My name is Heather Sparovich and I am on the board of the Latter-day Saint Educator Society. I'm also a curator here at BYU at the Education Society. Um, today we have two presenters, two women. A half presenters. Three. Three presenters. We'll say three because two and a half sounds bad. Three presenters. Um, the first one is going to be Brian Mead. He is a manager of student learning. He's over the adapted needs for seminaries and institutes of religion for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints. He began his career teaching seminary and institute, and he received all of his degrees from BYU bachelor's in neuroscience a master's in psychology, and a PhD in applied social psychology. Our second speaker is Jonathan Wisco. He's an associate professor and director of the Laboratory for Translational Anatomy of Degenerative Diseases and Developmental Disorders at the Department of Anatomy and Neurobiology at Boston University School of Medicine. The lab is uh, interested in the anatomical validation of innovative neuroimaging and surgical techniques related to Alzheimer's disease, pathophysiology, Al Alzheimer's disease, you can tell I'm a humanities person. <laughs> <laughs> I understand the words and that's about it. Uh, it's very technical. Uh, John, <laughs> uh, John is also uh, the director of the Anatomy Academy. And the program was established in 2012 to teach anatomy, physiology, and nutrition concepts to elementary school children to combat the obesity ep epidemic. And then I'm going to, when John stands up to present, John will then introduce Liz, our third speaker. <laughs> okay. But, um, my wife was reading last night, and she was reading about Jonathan, and she was reading about me, and she said, oh, it's going to be really interesting to see how he's kind of dovetail <laughs> <laughs> together. Um, <laughs> Seminaries and Institutes and Neuroscience Professor. Um, <laughs> it is all the same. But whether you're coming to hear about how we can help people have a, have a meaningful experience with the Word of God or whether you're coming to hear about autism, one thing that I really do believe is that we're all here and we're all trying to teach truth. And we're all going to teach truth from kind of our different stewardships. And so it's going to be fun to see what we learn and, and what we're able to talk about. But again, my name is Brian Mead. I, I'm, I'm really excited to be here. I'm really excited that we have a chance just to come and to sit and to visit and to talk and to try to understand what we can do to help teach young people and, to, and just, well, just to teach all people um, about the Savior and what we can do to help them to have a meaningful experience with that. But in order to set that up, how many of you have ever stood in this place before? How many of you have ever had a chance to stand on the Continental Divide? Whether you have or you haven't, the Continental Divide is one of those really fascinating things for me. I mean, you know how it works. I mean, imagine that we have two raindrops that are falling to the ground. They're falling at the exact same time. They're falling at the exact same speed. But they're only 10 feet apart. And one lands five feet on the eastern side of the Continental Divide. Well, where's that raindrop going to ultimately end up? Yeah, it's the Atlantic Ocean. Well, if it lands five feet on the western side of that Continental Divide, where's that going to go? Isn't it amazing that just by a couple of feet, they can end up in vastly different places and have vastly different experiences and outcomes. Well, I really do believe that there are certain beliefs, there are certain assumptions, there are certain things that we just hold on to that are a lot like the continental divide beliefs. That depending on which side of the issue we land on, we come to very different conclusions and we come to very different ideas. And I just want to share some of those beliefs that I really hold on to and they're really just kind of the core of who I am. And hopefully they're the core of who all of us are as religious educators. Because if we really believe that we're going to help all, all people have a meaningful experience with the Word of God, there are just certain things that we just need to believe. And they're these right here. We need to have an absolute confidence in the power of the Word. <coughs> we need to hold on and have faith in the Word and the Spirit. And we just need to trust in the individual. And, and let me share with what I mean by that. Let's just start with this one. I just want you to take a moment and I just want you to think. What are some of the experiences that have given you faith and trust in the Word of God? What are some of those experiences that you've either had in your own life or what are some of those experiences you've had with other people that have helped you to know that the Word of God has power? Yeah, I'd love answers. Um, to me, I kind of learned backwards. If I experience something 
and then I read the scripture about it and go, whoa, that's what really just happened. Um, I've been sharing Second Timothy with a lot of people. Deceivers, live children not listening to their parents, on and on and on. And they're like, Nicodemus said this. is like, whoa, 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 way back. And so having experienced that every day in my profession and then reading the scriptures about it, one more example, sorry. My mother, when when I was little, my dad worked on, I live in California, and we um, had a Navy sh a shipyard in our town. And my dad worked on that shipyard. And one time he was, they were on lockdown for three days. They had nuclear submarines there, and they didn't know, you know, I was little, they didn't know, you know, what kind of attack they were expecting, whatever. So for three days, my dad didn't get, home, get to come home, and I was terrified. I didn't know what was going on. And my mom opened the scriptures and she talked about wars and numbers of wars and how the Lord knew this was going to happen and, you know, things were going to... And I, I remember that discomforting me. And so if I experience something and then I see it in the scriptures, because I can read things in the scriptures and, and not experience them and then I have to go through it for myself. Um, that's kind of how I know the word is the word. It's beautiful. Thank you. Please. I served in Japan, and you, there you have a lot of underwhelming missionary experiences. Um, and you don't really feel like you're making an impact. You're just really seeing, I don't know, that was my experience at least. But um, I, I know that there were these specific situations where people just like planted the seed or just like opened their scriptures. Like it, they were just like a totally new person. We had one in um, recent convert who just never really read, and we're like, just like open the book or like just like read a verse and like the next time we came visited her it was like she had like this light in her eyes and it was because like she, she had credited accredited it to reading the scriptures and so just to see like that strengthened my confidence in the power of, of the scriptures and how it can um, help me. Beautiful. Which mission did you go to in Japan? Nagoya. Nagoya. Fantastic. Please. I'll add a, a story to Japan. Um, <laughs> I had a cousin, Gordon Porter, and he was a missionary in Japan years ago. He's in his 70s now, and subsequently went back as a mission president and an MTC president. But at any rate, he was at a state conference, and this general authority wanted to meet him. Well, it was Elder Kikuchi, and he, Elder Kikuchi says, do you remember me? You And Elder Porter said, no. He said, you baptized me. He was a teenager, and he was, you know, they encountered him, look, he, look, look, what that one encounter did. You look at that one encounter and that one experience and that one person who grabbed onto the Word of God. You see, the Word of God has the power to change us. Just look at some of the promises that have been given in the Scriptures and through modern prophets on the power of the Word. Well, maybe just hit a couple of them. If you have somebody who's comfortable reading for us, should be willing to read this verse in First Nephi. Thanks, Lord. I said unto them that whosoever would hearken unto the word of God and would hold fast unto it, they should they would never perish, neither should could the temptations and the fiery darts of the adversary overpower them unto blindness to lead them away to destruction. Yeah, I love that verse, and there's so many things that we could share from it. But I mean, just look at the power of the word of God in that verse. I mean, normally as you think of like the fiery darts, when, when I, for years and years when I thought of the fiery darts and I thought of Satan launching those fiery darts, in my mind, I thought that Satan would aim for the heart, because that just made sense to me. But did you catch in there, what does the Word of God protect? The eyes. It's the eyes. If you want a fascinating study of the Scriptures, look at the, what the fiery darts are aimed at in the Scriptures. And you think of, well, what does the Word of God help us to see? And I hope that all of you have had experiences in the Word of God where you've seen that the Word of God has helped you to see the love your Heavenly Father has for you. And I hope that you've seen in the Word of God that you've seen where you fit in your Heavenly Father's plan and that He has a role for you and that He has a place for you. You see, that's the confidence that comes from being in the Word of God. Another thing that comes, or another blessing that comes from being in the Word of God is given to us from Jacob, Nephi, gender brother. And it's a verse that I absolutely love. Look at what the Word of God can do for us. It says, and it supposeth me that they have come up hither to hear the pleasing word of God, yea, the word which filled the wounded soul. 
just think of those experiences that you've had, those people around you, and just see that you're really part of the shame part. And it can be peace. Just one last one for another shot. Um, I don't know there are a lot that we can share. Have somebody who's willing to read this first. Thank you so much. Scriptures are like packets of light that illuminate our minds and give place to guidance and inspiration from on high. They can become the key to open the channel to communion with our Father in heaven and his beloved Son, Jesus Christ. How powerful. <laughs> but the Word of God has power because it helps connect us to our Father in heaven. And it helps us to have experiences with him. And so if we're going to help all people have a meaningful experience in the Word of God, the first thing that we need to absolutely believe is that the Word of God can transform us and that it can change us and that it has power. A second one of those continental divide type beliefs that leads you to a very different outcome if you believe in is that you have faith in the Lord and that you have faith in the Spirit. You have faith in the Lord and you have faith in His plan that He has for us. It's one of those things that sometimes, well, let me share this scripture from the book of Exodus. This is one of those verses that I read years ago, and it just didn't really stand out to me. It really didn't have a whole lot of impact in my life until a little while ago. And this is when, do you remember when Moses was first called to go back to Egypt? How did he feel about going back to Egypt and talking to Pharaoh? Yeah, he didn't love the idea for a lot of reasons. First of all, Pharaoh's Pharaoh. But do you remember what Moses was saying, why he couldn't do it? He was slow in speech. And I love what the Lord said to him in this verse. Do you have somebody who'd be willing to read that for us? Thank you so much. And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man for now, or who maketh the dumb, or the deaf, or the seen, or the blind? Hath not I the Lord? As I read that verse, I, I don't believe that the Lord created all disabilities, difficulties, and challenges in this life. But what I do know is that the Lord created this mortal existence where he knew that there would be those of us that would experience those difficulties and disabilities and challenges. And as the Lord created this plan where he knew that these things would be experienced, he knew that he, he, he created the plan so that all experiences fit within it. I think sometimes as we go through experiences or we, we have loved ones that go through experiences that sometimes feel or seem out of the norm of mortality, we think we don't have a place for us in the plan. But who is the creator of mortality? And who knew that we would all experience these things? And so there's not any of us that stand outside of the plan. God created this plan and knew of all of our experiences. And so as we go through these experiences, or as the Lord says that I have a plan for all of you and that all of you can learn and all of you can grow, that includes all of us, even those with difficulties and challenges. And him knowing that all of us would experience different things and yet wanting to communicate with us, he created a way to communicate to every one of us through the Spirit. I mean, Moroni teaches us this just really, really simple verse. Right at the end of the Book of Mormon, he put it the plates, and by the power of the Holy Ghost, you may know the truth of all things. Well, my question for you, is it say in the Scriptures, does it have any qualifiers to that phrase? Does it say, by the power of the Holy Ghost, you can know the truth of all things unless you're a three-year-old with way too much energy and sunbeams? Is that what it says in the scriptures? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what? For some of us that have taught the sunbeams, we may think that from time to time. But it's not true. Or anywhere in the scriptures does it say something along the lines that by the power of the Holy Ghost you may know the truth of all things unless you're experiencing one of the challenges of mortality. It's just not there. That God's Spirit can teach and testify the truth to all people. I'm grateful for lessons that allow us to learn, and I have one of those that taught me something, and then just a little while later I was talking to a sister in my ward, and she came and we were talking about her church calling, and she was feeling a little bit frustrated, because the sister is so full of faith, and she is such a disciple, but she struggles with chronic anxiety and depression. And as we were visiting together, she shared with me that she didn't think she was being very good, or she wasn't serving, she wasn't as, as good as other Relief Society presidents in the church because she, she was saying she didn't feel that she received revelation like the others. But I asked her what she meant by that, and she shared that she said, well, I, I just don't feel the spirit like others. And I said, what do you mean? And she started describing, I mean, think about it. What are the terms that we use to describe how we feel the Holy Ghost? 
Just shout them out. What are some of those descriptive terms? We say still small waters. Still small. What was that? Your bosom burns within you. Any other peace? And we started to talk about that. I just said, you know what? Because of my depression and anxiety, I rarely feel peace. And here was this wonderful, incredible woman who felt she wasn't receiving revelation because she didn't feel the spirit in the way that others described it. And I looked at her and I asked her a question. I said, do you really believe that a member of the Godhead, the one that's here to testify of truth, won't speak to you because of this challenge of mortality? She said, what do you mean by that? And then we went to the scriptures and we started to look at other ways that the Holy Ghost teaches and testifies of truth that you may not feel those warm fuzzies in the way that she put it, but impressions and thoughts can come to mind. You see, we need to have absolute confidence that the Lord has a plan for all of us and He teaches all of us truth through His Spirit. And then finally, one last one, is that we trust in the individual. Now this is a really, really packed phrase that we can talk in a lot of different ways of how we can trust in individuals. But Joseph Smith shared a quote that I absolutely love. That I know many of you have heard. Do I have anybody who'd be willing to read that for us? Awesome, thank you so much. Joseph Smith, all minds and spirits that God ever sent into the world are susceptible of launch. What do you think that quote means? What do you think Joseph Smith was meaning when he said that? We can all grow. Yeah, we can all grow. And I love that promise because when he says all that we can all grow, is he just talking about all as in like those that fit within the st statistical normal, within the standard deviation? All is pretty. Wait, say that again. And this all is pretty powerful. How come? Because it includes everything. It's not all but, it's all. And it's accessible to everybody. I love that teaching from the prophet Joseph Smith. He says every single one of us that come into this mortal existence, no matter what circumstances we come into, whether we're born in poverty or we're born in wealth, whether we're born with perf well, seemingly perfect bodies or maybe bodies with some challenges, that every single one of us can learn and grow, and that every one of us in some limited capacity can exercise agency to become like our Heavenly Father. You see, if we're going to really sit and start talking about how we can make the scriptures accessible for all learners, these really are beliefs that every one of us needs to hold on to. Wait, wait. Before you go past trusting the individual, I just want to say that I think that every spirit seeks enlargement. And that if we trust in that, even those who are seemingly misbehaving, we can discern what they're, what kind of enlargement they're seeking through that computer. If you can trust that, you can teach with so much more power. I mean, you're obviously speaking from some experience, just in what I can hear in your voice. What experiences have helped you to know that or believe that? Can I, can I have, um, just, just having the spirit to see what people wanted when they were misbehaving and trying to help them. You know, in their in their immature way, trying to get what they needed uh, through misbehavior, and then helping them be able to get what they really needed without that. You know. I, yeah, or go. Well, I, I was going kind of go along with what you're saying. I think one of um, one of the things that comes to my mind is the thought too about that they're all seeking truth. And whether, regardless of where they're at in terms of like religion and activity, every every soul wants more truth. And so, you know, even if we go back to, well, I guess one of the thoughts we heard this morning, um, the thought that light cleaves unto light, and the more light you receive, the more light you'll seek. And eventually, if people come to find light, they'll want more light, which will always lead them to the Savior, whether they give it that language or not, or they're aware of it or not. You know, the more truth you find, He is the way, the truth, and the life. So, so the same spirit, I think that it, we don't know, not even just in a religious context, but in, in, a, in a broader scale, they're all seeking truth. And if we see them as truth seekers, then it allows us, regardless of what behaviors are in front of us, to find opportunities for them to come to know and love more truth. I like what she said there, because I really think that 
that a lot of people believe in what they're teaching and they believe in the power of the Spirit to teach, whether they're teaching the Gospel or whether they're teaching some academic subject, um, which, you know, if it's true, is the Gospel anyway. So, you know, a, a, people have those two things, but, but if, if they miss out on trusting the individual, then that never comes through. I believe you. I really do believe you. I mean, as we sit and talk about this idea of how we teach, these have just got to be part of our core. We've just got to absolutely believe that, that the Word of God is meant to bless and illuminate and help all people. We really do need to believe that God within this plant has ways that He teaches and testifies the truth to all of His children and that all people can want to grow. And if we start from that point, then it leads us to a very different conclusion. It leads to very different outcomes. I mean, Isaiah said it really beautifully, where he said, and all thy children shall be taught the Lord. I mean, he could have taught that truth. He could have said it, and thy children shall be taught of the Lord. If he would have phrased it that way, would it still have been true? It would have, but I love how he concludes that phrase, all, that all can be taught. And if we come from that point, that's our continental divide, that we believe that all people can be taught, then we treat them in a different way as we begin trying to expand and make the Word of God accessible to all of them. Time always goes fast, so in the few minutes that we have left, I just want to share now that we've, that we've talked about beliefs, so that we've talked about truth, about God and His children, just certain things that we can do in order, in order to help make the Word of God accessible to all. And I want to start with two ideas. The first is focus on the learn. We know this, that there are all sorts of learning styles. And if we really believe that all children of God can learn, then we're going to focus on the way, or we're going to find a way in order to help them to learn. I mean, my dad, he believes the only way to study the scriptures is paper scriptures, red pencils, sitting down at the table. How many of you are those types of learners? He's a very visual learner. But is that the only way to bring the Word of God into your life? Scott saying yes. Scott, the answer is no. <laughs> Scott, I'm going to force you to say it. What are other ways that learners, what are other ways that people can access the Word of God? Yeah, there's audio. There's digital. There's digital. Okay. Yeah, this is our digital guy right over here. But is, is audio learning of the scriptures, is that a lesser way of learning the scriptures? It's a different way. My wife in the mornings, or my wife as she goes on her walks, or runs in the morning, she listens to General Conference, and that's the way that she makes that part of her life. And even though I love to sit down and I love to have the scriptures in front of me, her experiences with the scriptures are different in life, but they're no less powerful. So focus on learning style. Elder Clark did another masterful example this morning as he sat and he taught us. How did Elder Clark teach us this morning? What did he give us? Do you remember the name of the guy and the gal? He gave us a real world situation, he gave us a case study, and what did we do with that case study? It took you into the scriptures to find out how to apply it. That's a different learning style. And is that learning style and method okay? Of course, absolutely. And so if you really believe that all people can learn and grow, you're going to find the way that it's best for them. And for some, it may be sitting down in the way that you do it, or the way that Scott does it with paper scriptures. And others, it may be audio. In other ways, it may be a situation, it may be a case study. It may be both. It may be both. And I think trusting them means that they'll, they know they're the least that they'll find their way. Mm -hmm. I think you're exactly right. Another principle is that we need to honor agency. And we need to expect people to exercise their agency to the degree that they can. You think about it. I don't want to go back to too many examples that I've heard over the last couple of days, but Scott shared a really good example with his wife. Your wife right now is teaching in the primary. How many of you have ever had that wonderful opportunity of teaching in the primary? Mm -hmm. I decided the week before I get released from my current calling, I'm going to sustain myself as a primary worker. Um, because I love that experience. But Scott's wife, she wants to help these primary children to exercise their agency to the degree that they can. And so she's helping them to learn how to do it. She stood up one week and she said, open up to the book of John, I think you said. And she said, okay, open up to the book of John. And what did all these primary children do? Nothing. Because they didn't have the capacity to exercise their agency to go to the book of John because they didn't know how to do it. So as a brilliant teacher, 
she taught them of where to go on the front to look up page numbers. And she said, do you know, I'll know how to get to the book of John now? And she taught them. So next time as they come into primary, what does she expect them to do? Yeah, to exercise their agency to the degree that they can and to find the book of John or to find other books in the scriptures. You see, if we're really going to help people have meaningful learning experiences, we need to ask them to exercise their agency and we need to understand where their agency is at in order to do that. One last final principle is if we want to make the scriptures accessible for all learners, we need to focus on what the scriptures are all about. Do you remember what Nephi taught? I'll just go to it really quickly. It's 2 Nephi chapter 25, and it's verse 26. He teaches the purpose of all scriptures. When, he's, when he said this verse, And we talk of Christ, we rejoice in Christ, we preach of Christ, we prophesy of Christ. And we write according to our prophecies that our children may know to what source they may look for a remission of their sins. I can promise as we focus on the source, if we focus on the main truth of the scriptures, as we focus on the scripture, as we focus on the Savior, it unlocks the scriptures for us. And we can do that in a number of ways. We can focus on the, by identifying the titles of the Savior. Those titles are meant to teach us about who He is. We can ask the question, what does, the save, or what does this teach you about the Savior? Because simply by focusing people on Christ, it helps unlock the power of the scriptures. I had an experience when I went and observed a class at Spectrum Academy just a little while ago. And the teacher was teaching a block of scripture. And then the teacher just asked a simple question. He said, what does this story teach you about your Savior and you. And this girl who had been silent for all of class, she just said, I know Jesus loves me, and I love him. You see, in that moment, as a teacher focused on Christ, as he trusted in the Word, and unlocked this moment for this girl to bear a simple and yet powerful testimony that for her is what she needed to get out of that experience and that state. I, uh, I love what I get to do. I hope all of you have things that you get to love what you do. And I love what I get to do because I know that it really is God's work. I know that each of us, in whatever capacity or sphere we're operating in, that we get to operate in that and we get to help find truth. And that truth comes as we point people in our lives unto Christ and unto the Savior. I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I, I guess we can do it. I mean, these guys just take our two before I go. Just, are there any questions before Jonathan starts? Okay. So come grab. Oh, please. Did you raise your hand? Right in the back. Okay. No, sorry. I'm interested, in, I'm interested in your title. Of the Tell us a little more about what you do as far as this role. Um, so I'm part of the Training Services Division of Seminaries and Institutes, which that title kind of explains what we do, that we, that we train. But within Seminaries and Institutes, my specific role is we're worried about how, how we can provide religious education for individuals with challenges. Yeah. So we have that umbrella of adaptive needs. And so at work, at, at, at the church office building, yeah. My focus is how do we teach individuals with disabilities, but I also sit on the, the they're, they're referred to as specialty topics for the church. How do we help individuals um, preventing abuse? How do we, um, same gender, as, as we talk about those things. Um, just how do we help those that are going through significant life challenges, poverty, you know, those types of things. And so that's what I get to do. It's a pretty sweet opportunity. It's a pretty sweet gig. Anatomy book. Yeah. Sound. <laughs> sound is working. You weren't awake before, you are now. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. Uh, so, interestingly enough, uh, I was inspired to add a few slides to my presentation because they're actually very directly linked. So whereas um, 
Brian, Brian, Brian. Brian. <laughs> My son did tell me when he read your name, he said, put PhD behind your name to show and you went to as much school as he did. <laughs> That's fair, that's fair. So as Brian pointed out, um, he talked about the scriptures. What we're gonna talk about is how the same principles can be related in a real life scenario, and that is within the classroom. So, that, so um, I wanna welcome Liz Banner, who is the principal of Spectrum Academy uh, uh, down in Pleasant Grove, and Gary Seastrand, who is my collaborator, one of my collaborators on this project. And he is um, in charge of sites, which is the um, public school partnership with uh, BYU. And Gary, no, uh, Paul is part of that as well, right? So, um, and then the people in the middle are just some of the very few students who have been part of this project. So I, I want to um, just say we're going to talk about Anatomy Academy. We're going to talk about the, the engaged learning experiences that are paraprofessional. Uh, undergraduate and professional students have gone and experienced as they have taught and the results that we have studied in their teaching experience and how that had a major impact on their learning experience and then Liz is going to talk about specific stories so I already told Liz I'm going to just drive through all the stuff that I want to talk to you because ultimately it boils down to the stories and, and that's where you'll find the richness of this program I want to start with here. So this is an exhibit that I put together with Heather Severovich. If you haven't had a chance to go down to the Education and Design Gallery, please do. It's amazing. Uh, we started this exhibit on body skill of light uh, when I was at BYU a number of years ago. And I, I added it as part of my curriculum in teaching the anatomical sciences to our BYU students. And I wanted, here's the, the front title. Here is the punchline. Right? The punchline to this is, what we did is documented, we went through every scripture in the, can in the canon and identified where um, uh, a specific, explicit mention of a human body, uh, co an anatomical concept came up. Of course, we had used the word mind for brain, because brain wasn't going to show up in the scriptures. And um, we, we counted how often they showed up. And the bottom line I want to share with you is that anatomy, there are more references to anatomy in the scriptures than agriculture and economics combined. And yet, we give stories of agriculture and economics all the time, in all of our lessons. But what is it that we uh, do to communicate with our Heavenly Father, even in the temple? It happens through here, through here. This is the only conduit through which the Spirit communicates. Uh, with the Heavenly Father. It is your own body. So anatomy uh, sometimes gets a bad rap, but it's probably the most personal and the most intimate communication device that you have with Heavenly Father. We put up this exhibit. It now lives in the Life Sciences Building as a permanent exhibit. These are drawings that I received from um, one of my mentors, Dr. Carmen Clementi, who is the father of American anatomy when I was at UCLA. And uh, from those drawings, we were inspired to find the scriptures that match them. And this is just one of the walls, but you'll see it's got a little flip tab on there. What I did, what a student did is identify a scripture, students would, uh, between Heather and I, and on the back, on inside, you can flip the tab, and I have created what that anatomical structure is relative to that scripture. And so um, I challenge you, if you decide to, to be able to go down there and look at it, to find my favorite uh, anatomical structure, and the hint is that it is the keystone, all right? Um, and so hopefully you get a chance to see that. Okay, so that brings me to this, Anatomy Academy. When I came here to BYU almost seven years ago now, now I'm at Boston University School of Medicine. When I came, which is my alma mater, by the way, I got pulled back. <laughs> so when I came to BYU, the thing I noticed was that uh, like just about any other anatomical sciences program, students were coming in, best in the country, memorizing a bunch of information, and remembering none of it. So how can I get my students to internalize and realize something that is deeply personal to the relationship with Heavenly Father, and realize that it was important? Well, one way to do that is to just pound them with content. And I can tell you, bar none, that never works. Right? And in the context of scriptures, I wanted to mention this, if we pound our kids with scriptures without any important real-life context, which you actually spoke about, 
there's no relevance. And the same thing happens in, in, in the context of what we study academically. Somebody brought up something about, you know, all subjects are truth, and that's true, right? So here's the program. We have a group of um, paraprofessional teachers we call mentors. And those mentors come from a list of many, many different universities, as you can see here. Um, our professional schools are highlighted in blue. I won't list them all. I know you can all read. Um, and then uh, we have pre-professional students as well. These mentors uh, go into the classroom uh, that we have set up as a partnership and, and teach the students anatomical sciences concepts that help them understand why their bodies are important, how to take care of their bodies, and uh, maybe inspire them to make changes that can, that can help them become more healthy. And in essence, if you want to boil it down, we're teaching them the word of wisdom. Um, our students, our elementary school students, we're actually in more than 25 uh, classes, or school partners now in 45 classes. But we teach uh, underserved students and students in non-underserved communities. So the bottom line is we uh, try to reach out to students and uh, school partners that are open to this different kind of education. We also reach out to special needs classes, which was the point of today's talk, and this will talk about that a bit. So here's Anatomy Academy. Um, we teach anatomy, physiology, and nutrition as a hope of helping them become more self-aware of their bodies and their health. And we've uh, been with a, a number of different uh, uh, media sources, if you will, to advertise uh, what we do and how we can help. And we're going to see Gary here in a second as I pull this up. Talking about an Academy is um, uh, an outreach research program that we started at UCLA. It is a program that where we teach anatomy, physiology, and nutrition to fifth and sixth grade students as a part of a, an educational intervention against obesity. There are some really significant benefits of anatomy academy. Number one, we see students that are highly engaged, so they're participating, they're contemplating what's being taught to them and they're taking it in. I love the interaction between the people who are presenting and the students. There's a real positive interaction there. The students are engaged. They're having fun and they're learning at the same time. It says uh, there's an excitement in the room. They're very interested. It's just the best of all. And how are the, uh, how do you think the mentors are benefiting from this? Well, I, I think the feeling that, um, that kind of serves that comes from giving service. I mean, they see the light come on in the student's eyes and they're feeling that like they're really giving something of their knowledge for the benefit of others. So I think it helps them in terms of, again, that feeling of um, doing something that benefits someone else. And I can use my knowledge to benefit someone else. With Anatomy Academy, it's a great public health intervention because you're teaching all these young kids how to take care of themselves so that they can be healthy in the future and like we don't have to go to the hospital. And another reason is like I'm really interested in the body and um, I think it's awesome to teach people about it and especially kids because they're just so excited and I love to teach so that's another reason. <laughs> In the anatomy, nutrition, and physiology, even though that's the main part of the program, what I'm really, really excited about is are these relationships that are formed. And the opportunity for students here at BYU uh, and, and the University of Utah and Utah Valley University to be able to get an opportunity to see if they like this type of interaction. This isn't just about the books. It's not just about the grades. It's about those relationships. That's very, very exciting to me. And I'm glad that we're able to provide this opportunity to everybody. Okay, so a couple of responses. What are some of the similarities and differences that you saw in Anatomy Academy to what you see in your child's or yours classroom, whether within the elementary school or even in the church? It's hands-on and very interactive. Yeah, it's it's fun, right? Yeah. Everybody's engaged. Everyone's engaged, 
right? What were some of the principles we learned about in our plenary speakers today? Right? The, the, the learning it is, uh, and knowledge is really, it's not for anything unless we're actually involved with it. Right? How, what are some other observations? Maybe one more. Yeah. It has direct application to their lives. I mean, they see mac and cheese boxes on the shelves every day at home, and so they are able to make the connection between what they're learning and how they're using. So I like how you said the word connection, because that principle is ubiquitous whether we're talking about religious education or whether we're talking about secular education. There's no difference. And, and in fact, the classroom should be no different. But how many of you have, have been in a, in a primary class? I also want to go in primary. <laughs> how, how many have gone in a primary class and the teacher has sat the kids there, and they're teaching here, and the, the kids are, they're not there. They're zoned out. And it's not because the content isn't good. I guarantee you the gospel is fine. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with it. Right? But maybe the way we engage our learners could use some re-examination. So um, we actually looked at this in, in detail, and we looked at our mentors, our prayer professionals. Now at some point in your life, you're either going to be a mentor, a teacher, or you're going to be a student. So try to imagine uh, where you fall in that spectrum at any given time, and how this may have an impact on how you view um, secular and, and religious education. So what we did is we asked our, our mentors, give us a self-evaluation of how you feel like your content delivery, student engagement, classroom management, professionalism, improvement in the program. All right, and here are their scales that they, they can use. So we also asked them some uh, reflection questions. What did you learn about yourself? How have you changed? What have you learned about working with kids? What will you take with you into your future career? And focus on these types of topics. Professionalism, preparation, classroom management, engagement, relatability, and discovery. Here's what we found out. We got an 89% response rate. More than half of the mentors improved on content delivery, student engagement, classroom management, and level of professionalism. None of them are professional teachers. Right? But we threw them into this environment to have them teach a content that they were barely starting to understand themselves and into an environment where they were with a learner. Right? Is that safe? Well, let's find out. <laughs> so what they realize is that they can make a, uh, a difference in the world now. They can acknowledge the importance of listening and teaching. Lives can and, change, can and will change with love. An insight to the effectiveness of guiding students through material rather than lecturing. Awareness of the value of respect in the learning environment. Cognizance of the power of individualized attention to motivate students. Reflection of one owns per, one's own personal growth through the open influence of students. That sounds no different than what we've been talking about today, right? Even in the context of religious education. Here are some quotes of what our mentors expressed. Working with the kids helped me remember how much I really do love to learn. I'll tell you as professors, we're really good at killing learning. <laughs> and, and, and the reason why is because, I mean, I could go off on the educational model that we've all grown up with, but we are really good at squashing creativity and thought that you mentioned. Right? Why do we do that? Why do, why do we put up with a system that does that? I think it's a public school system. <laughs> I'll get there in a second. You said professor. So. I said professor right in a second. <laughs> I come up with learning activities that help them be engaged. I focus on directing, directly asking this person, this student, comprehension questions in order to reel her back in if she starts to wander away. In other words, the education becomes individualized. Uh, when we were playing kickball, I had the students identify parts of the body they were using to carry out the task at hand. Right. Um, wants to help their students feel comfortable enough with me to share the things, to share things, and trust that I will give them the best feedback that I can. So I like this quote a lot, and there's a lot on there, but I like this quote a lot because feedback is an important part of teaching. I I, I love this because teaching is dancing. And I'm a terrible dancer. I'm just absolutely horrible at it. But I love it. I absolutely love it because I'm constantly teaching and learning in the context of trying to become a better dancer. And I know I will never be a good dancer, but I love to learn. 
And if you can imagine that, um, teachers and students teaching each other, instead of somebody like me right now pounding information through your ears and eyes. Um, help the students with various resources to discover information for themselves. Brian, you said that. Okay. So now, we were curious to know, through our Anatomy Academy experience, uh, why is it that whenever we show up at a school that happens to have somebody in the autism spectrum, that, that child pops open, wakes up. And now, I have a child on the autism spectrum, so this is very, very personal to me. And what we discovered was, strangely enough, when we got there, they woke up. When we left, they went right back into their typical game. And so I thought there is something to this. We've got a, we've got, we need a larger population of autism students, and that's where I approached Liz. And I asked her, can we run this program at Spectrum Academy? And can we find out what happens? Let's run a little experiment. So we got an IRB approval to run this experiment. Now some differences in the normal um, uh, ratio, we give uh, two mentors for every eight to 10 children. At Spectrum, we have a one-to-one -one ratio. Sometimes one to two. Um, and we do this sort of matching game to increase the probability that the mentor and the student will uh, have good chemistry. So we did some experiments. We, we started by saying, well, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's the fact that we've got, you know, cool mentors and cool activities. So let's take both of those away. And we just gave a, a reading lesson on anatomy. Totally boring. I would have zoned out. Look at what the kids are doing. Right? Nothing. <laughs> they're, they're completely checking out. Then what we did is we added the mentors, and um, the kids became more engaged with their mentors. Then we added the activities, the engaged activities, and all of a sudden the magic happened. There's something, there's a synergy behind a trustable uh, instructor and the activity that they're giving. In other words, you can be the best teacher, but if your activities are not engaging, that's going to be a tough environment, and vice versa. You could have some really good activities, but if you don't have teachers that care, that's also going to be a compromised environment. And we just, just said right here. Um, okay, so I want to skip to the conclusion because I want to get to Liz's stories and the time you have remaining. Uh, I think this last bullet point to me is the most important. I hope that you understand that whether we're talking about a religious context secular context, you as parents and individuals in the community don't have to uh, be just okay with a teaching environment and learning environment that's not going to help your kids uh, love learning. We don't want to squash learning in our kids. And, and that's going to take more than just us teachers and professors to be able to, or administrators to be able to do that. We need your help to be able to make that happen. Okay, Liz. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so I just had a thought. I don't know if any of you remember Elder Holland's address from one conference when he said, I'm the only thing between you and like your ice cream at the end of the <laughs> thing, right? That's kind of how I feel right now. I'm the only thing between you and going home. So hopefully this will help and support you in your different areas and where you are at. Just quickly, my name is Liz Banner. I was a dental assistant, stayed home with my kids for a long time, and my youngest was diagnosed with autism. And it was at a time 18 years ago where there was a not, not a lot of information on autism, at least not a lot in the school systems. And so through a lot of fasting and prayer, my husband and I decided that I would go back and get my special education degree, K through 12, and then I went back and got my master's degree in administration so that I could help and support not only my son, but those around me that I knew had the same challenges that we were going through. So this is him right up here. And um, that's when we opened the Pleasant Grove campus. I was principal at the North Salt Lake campus and then came over to the Pleasant Grove campus when we opened there. But these are some of my inspirations that led me to here. Before I talk about Spectrum Academy, I want to say how grateful I am to be here and present here today for many, many reasons. But two of the main reasons is I love presenting with John. He's amazing, and I've been able to present with him once before and glean from his knowledge. The second thing is, I presented at a lot of autism conferences and a lot of other places, and I've never been able to put that gospel 
part into my presentations and it's such a big part of me and a part of why this has been so successful and why we can do the things we do. And I haven't been able to share that and so I'm grateful for the opportunity to dovetail those and to know that we, when we are successful, it is through the power of Jesus Christ that we are successful. Spectrum Academy is a charter school in Utah for children with high functioning autism and others that would benefit from a unique learning environment. So when John approached me, I was trying to get this new school started with 450 kids that all had different challenges, abilities, strengths, everything, and then 130 new staff members that I was uh, supposed to help work with these new students. So it was a little crazy and a lot of things were going on. And so I had a lot of questions when John came to me about time and if it was going to work with the time that we had, with our behaviors that we had, with the assessments that I needed to do, with the sensory overload that might happen in our school. So the first thing I thought of was time and really what the curriculum would do, where we were at, and the assessments. I won't go too far into this because I want to get to the other things. But with the Anatomy Academy, it was based on the same principles that we were trying to teach in the school system anyway. So it was wonderful that it had that application to it. The sensory, you're talking about behaviors. If you know those that have autism, you will know that sensory is a big component of theirs. And when you get a lot of people in one room, what happens to somebody that's autistic? Right? It is very sensory overload. So one of my concerns was that we would have a lot of people in a little room with these kids that we worked so hard to not have that environment of overstimulus. And so that was what, but what we found was the engagement when the mentors came in was off the charts. It was amazing, even though that was a challenge for them and we had to do that, the engagement that we had was off the charts and I'll tell you why I think that was. John told you of his. One thing is, they had a big brother, kind of that one-on-one -on -one connection. Somebody just older than them that was coming in and getting them excited about other things. But it didn't come naturally. I'm going to tell you, the first time we had mentors walk into Spectrum Academy, there was some nervousness with my students. But I'm going to be honest, there was a lot of nervousness with the mentors too. They were walking into an environment where they did not know how to act. And either way, they didn't know how to interact with a lot of our students. But they came in and they worked one-on-one -on -one with those students. And they didn't talk about anatomy right away. They found what the student wanted to talk about, whether it be Minecraft, whatever it needed to be. And they got down on their level <coughs> and found out about the individual. And isn't that what Christ has done with us, with individuals? When an individual has a challenge, that's what we learned from him, that he gets down on their level and helps them. So they had that one-on-one -on -one connection. And when their cool big brother that was cooler than them was leaving to go out to play kickball or to do an experiment, they wanted to go right along with them because it was neat. And they had a friend that could help and support them in their learning that they were doing. I love this quote by President Lonson. It says, never let a problem to be solved become more important than a person to be loved. I find throughout the years I've worked at Spectrum Academy with uh, those that are autistic for 11 years now. And I find that it's very challenging, not that people don't want to work and be with them and love them, but it's a challenge and it's hard sometimes. So we need to look past the challenge and the problem and look at that person that we are trying to help and support. I want to tell you one story and then I'll wrap up. We had a we have an individual. His name in this story is Preston. <laughs> Not in real life, but in this story his name is Preston. This student had been he was in probably 10th grade at the time. And he had autism. He has autism. He would not talk to hardly anyone. Not quite selective mutism but he really, really struggled speaking with anyone. Teachers would try, had been in the school system for a long time, a lot of people had tried with him. Speech therapists had tried with him, 
everybody had tried to get him to have that communication and that one-on-one. -on -one. What happened was one mentor came in, and I really attribute this to the caliber two of the BYU students here who pray about this and think about this as they go in as well. But he connected with Preston, and he took the time necessary to sit and to find out what Preston liked and what he didn't like. And he probably sat there and talked about Minecraft with Preston for at least two sessions that they came in to do this. And he would just sit there and just concentrate on him. A remarkable thing happened. Preston knew that what he was saying was important to somebody else and knew that what he was doing was important and started communicating back and forth with his mentor. But not only that, Preston, who would not go out to any activities or do anything when there was an activity in the classroom, decided that this was his buddy and this was his friend and he was going to go with him to do the activities and the different things. So he went out with this mentor and participated in the activities, which was amazing. What happened past that was he was able to generalize that a little more and start talking to other people at Spectrum and do that. Now we have a program at Spectrum Academy where we have a cafe inside our school and the students learn to serve food to our teachers. Once they are good with that, they can go to the BYU concession stand at the football games and serve to those. Preston did that. It was an amazing day because of one individual and because of one mentor who took the time to help and support him and do that and to look, overcome and look, not look at the problem, but overcome and look at Preston and where he needed to be and what he needed to be doing. And that would not have happened without the help and support from this. So I won't tell you about that story, but I do want to end with this. A lot of times when we look at kids and learning, and we have a lot of kids with challenging behaviors at Spectrum Academy, but I don't think we're the only isolated place that has a lot of challenging behaviors or a lot of challenging things that go on especially when we teach individuals. It can be little kids, it can be 12 year olds, it can be 26 year olds, it doesn't matter. But it is worth it then, now, and forever. And that's why Elder Jeffrey L. Holland, that we are in this so that it is worth it to go through what we need to do and to come to these conferences and learn these things so that we can go with them in the long run. And I said, this is the Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Are there any questions? So there's, there's a few butchers here in Utah County. Um, in fact, uh, the, the demand on, on animal organs got so high that the butchers started turning us down. <laughs> so, so we had to be more judicious at, at, at regulating how many requests we could give to them. So typically organs that the butchers don't quite sell. Like yeah, not, not too many people buy cow parts. That's a great market tool. Yeah. Um, what about applying this program to those of us in California that teach in public schools? Ah, so we are we started in California. Um, so we have we have centers in UCLA and Cal North State. Starting the program is super easy. Yeah. So so um, if you want now, by the way, this is our program. If you want to run something similar, we can help you get started as well, or you can run this one, whatever. But at most. It's $200 to start an anatomy academy kit. Curriculum is freely available. I will train, typically via um, uh, video conferencing. And then uh, the, the thing that is actually probably the hardest is setting up a school partner and convincing the principal. <laughs> and, and actually, we've had a, a, a really good success rate. And then finding a stream of mentors. So you need a, a stream of, of students. Nursing students make, are great because there's lots of them. Okay, um, there you go, medical schools. And I have mentors and former mentors and coordinators that are all over the country that have been willing to. Uh, that makes sense. They've probably done it. <laughs> I taught one, one out of every three students at BYU, so the chances are is they probably. So contact me. Any others? Great. Well, thank you for coming. We really appreciate it. Oh, wait. Okay.